But it gives me great pleasure to bring on board a very old and a dear friend of mine, someone whom I've interacted and learned a lot in the last uh, 20 years. That's Chris Woods. Chris, fantastic to have you back. Thank you for joining us. This is the first time I'm interacting with you after a while on camera. So good to see and uh, good, to, uh, good to have you on the show. Now, Chris, three weeks ago, or I would say four weeks ago, then market narrative was inflation is back, bond yields will go above 2%. But last couple of days, it's the reverse of that. And the new narrative is growth is going to get punctured. It is important to hunker down your expectations for GDP growth for the world for 2022. So what is happening in the market? Why are markets changing the orientation so rapidly? I have to admit this bond market rally is very weird in the sense that uh, it's taken place in the context of very high inflation numbers. The bond market rally kicked off in May when we had the biggest inflation number in America for many years. That was, that was easily explained. The market was selling on the event and the view was that the base effect peaked in May and so the inflation was peaking. But then last week, we had another June CPI report in America, which, then, which again came in well above expectations, but yet the bond market kept rallying. So I have to admit I'm somewhat mystified by the scale of the bond market rally. Many people are attributing it to technical factors like investor positioning, algo trading. But it seems to me the bond market is taking a very bearish view on this Delta variant which is now so obviously has surged already in India and is surging in Western world. And the bond market seems to be worried about renewed lockdowns. That's the only way I can rationalize the bond market action. So Chris, are we in a repeat of, let's say, what we saw at the beginning of 2019? Maybe, but actually the key issue right now is, is the bond market correct? Because Actually, this Delta variant is clearly extremely infectious, but so far the cases and fatalities are lagging dramatically. The right, the, sorry, not the cases, the hospitalizations and the fatalities are lagging dramatically the cases, particularly in the UK, which suggests vaccine efficacy. So to me, this is, this is different. The longer we, the more we see this lag between cases and hospitalizations, in many ways that's a positive, not a negative, because it suggests vaccine efficacy. There's also the Indian precedent, the COVID, uh, the Delta wave in India was dramatic in the way the cases soared. But then, as we know, there's, there was correspondingly a big, subsequently a big plunge in cases. Right. So, Chris, you've been making a case in your earlier arguments that you expect U.S. 10-year paper to go to 2%. Do you think eventually U.S. bond deals will cross 2%? Yes, there is a rally in the bond market, but do you think soon we could see a sell-off also? Well, yeah, no, well no, I'm very surprised by what's been... Before this week, you could rationalize the bond market action as um, technical because we'd had a big sell-off in bonds in the first quarter. We discounted a lot of bad news on inflation. And so it wasn't surprising the bond, mar the bond market went from 1.7 to, say, 1.3. But this week, we've broken key technical levels. And this week, we're signaling an inflation, a growth scare. So to me, bond yields long term, yeah, are at risk of heading higher because I'm assuming our monetary policy and fiscal policy remain very expansionary. But there's also a possibility in coming months, quarters, that the uh, Federal Reserve does what the BOJ does, has already done, and that is lock in bond yields. Mm -hmm. But for now, that's not the issue focusing on the markets. The, the bond market signaling a growth scare. And so the bond market is signaling that we, you know, that the economies may not reopen as pre quickly as previously thought because of this renewed COVID wave. So I think this is all about the pandemic issue, not about monetary fiscal policy. But you're absolutely right. Four weeks ago, people were talking about inflation and tapering. 
um, now the bond market is acting like the Fed's going to uh, resume balance sheet expansion. So, Chris, let's let's think through it. Markets are waiting for clarity on the Delta variant, whether it is going to be impacting the global growth or not. If one looks at the pattern, the pattern is that hopefully by October, November, we would know whether the world has world whether there is a third wave or not. So what happens after that? Do you think next 10, 15 days, next two or three weeks, markets will remain nervous while we will continue to oscillate between the narrative of uh, uh, narrative of inflation versus high growth? But once we get clarity on the third wave, which way things are moving, and hopefully we emerge on the right side of the third wave, uh, inflation scare will come back? Well, if the Indian president holds for the West, because the Indian precedent is the case is soared very quickly, but then collapsed very quickly. If that's the precedent for the West, then you should be buying cyclical stocks today. But the point is the Indian government did not lock down the economy nationally. And there wasn't political pressure to keep the economy closed. But the big difference between the Western world and India is that in the Western world, people are receiving welfare payments for doing nothing. So there's not the same pressure to reopen the economy. So, so what happens to growth stocks? Because typically growth stocks, they do well when interest rates are low, because that's how you start increasing discounting for them. I'm just speaking it for the benefit of our viewers. Do you see outperformance coming back in growth stocks, whether it is US tech stocks or Indian growth companies? Well, that's why that's why Fang stocks have resumed their rally with this bond correction, bond rally, because the lower U.S. bond yields are are beneficial for discounting the cash flows of these uh, companies like Amazon, Facebook that generate a lot of cash. Chris, you've been a long-term India bull, and you've been consistent with your view. So given where the growth dynamics are moving, how valuations are, the fact that crude is coming back, what is your current India positioning? No, well, my Indian positions always had a growth bias simply because there aren't many cyclicals in the Indian market. So my Indian portfolio is doing fine. But India is different actually from the rest of the world because India is, went through this pandemic and it hasn't, hasn't shut down. I mean, it had shut down at the local level, not the national level. So my only concern on India is simply the tactical one that you've done, the Indian market's done extremely well. Valuations are high. You're going to get some big IPOs coming into the market, which are going to generate a lot of uh, interest. And they may, they may take some liquidity out of the existing stocks. Mm -hmm. But any correction, in, any meaningful correction in India, in my view, should be bought. But so I'm remaining you... overweight India. So Chris, just to get it right, are you making a case that the bull market which started uh, in the throes of the pandemic, let's say April 2019 or May 2019, has a long life to go and we are still in the early stage of this equity bull market? Yeah, in India I do, unless we get it. The risk to India is the risk we get, we have in the rest of the world, that we get a new variant, which is as infectious as the Delta, but more lethal. But in the meantime, the good news is the vaccination rollout is accelerating in India. Chris, why do you feel that a new housing cycle has started? This reminds me of Chris Wood in 2006 and 7 when you famously came out with a report which said that India's total market cap, the representation of real estate in India's total market cap was minuscule. And after that, we saw mega bull run in Indian real estate stocks. Do you see evidence of that again? Oh, no, I, yeah, well, I was hoping, frankly, it was started earlier, but I think, no, I think one of the most positive stories in India, both from a micro and a macro standpoint, is the potential for a new residential property investment cycle, given the fact that we've had a more of a seven-year downturn. And what was interesting is we started to see evidence of the property upturn last year before the most recent wave hit. hit. But I think that is just delayed it. So how, housing looks extremely affordable in India. And I think the property developers one should be looking to own long term. And I think that also has the potential to act as a catalyst for the whole Indian economy. 
Indian housing is extremely affordable relative to income. And clearly the Indian property market has gone through a, no a number of structural shocks, be it demonetization, be it the Real Estate Regulation Act, be it GST, be it the pandemic. So the surviving developers will be able to take massive market share. Chris, there is a distinct shift in the way how global investors are now looking at Chinese internet companies, how the stock price of Alibaba has taken a hit, how other Chinese internet companies are facing the heat of Chinese authorities who are now clamping down on their regulatory operations. What do you think that means? Because that's one large popular crowded trade which could reverse. Yeah, but actually the Chinese internet companies are looking quite interesting now. When you, when you say they're washed out, what do you mean? The share prices? The stock price. Yeah, well, the Chinese government is frankly just regulating these companies in a way that they should already have been regulated in the Western world, but they have not. By, um, because they are monopolistic, they are a threat to small businesses. So I think it makes sense for a lot of this regulation in China, plus the Chinese government wants to control the data. But we've now had this regulatory agenda is quite extended. So personally, I would be looking to buy these Chinese internet stocks now and adding to China, weightings in China. On India, there's going to be a lot of the hype and excitement on the IPOs. So they, I'm sure they'll get listed and go up. They're going to be very expensive in the short term. But I think, so personally, I wouldn't be chasing the IPOs. But it, but I think it's good for the Indian market that this sector is going to get listed and it will further diversify the market. And these are these will be very interesting long term investments. Hmm. But in the but, short term, you're going to have a lot of hype. But Chris, in India, the reverse is happening. Paytm is going public. Zomato has just gone public. The Indian Chinese, the Indian Internet companies are just about getting created. And now they are tapping the public market also. Uh, you don't have an Internet company or Indian Internet company in your model portfolio. Can one of the new listings make to your portfolio? Well, I know I used to have one many years ago. Yeah, I just think it's good for them. Absolutely, there's a chance. Yeah, one wants to be positioned. But one needs to remember that in China, the internet stocks didn't have foreign competition. Hmm. Whereas uh, in India, you have the big US companies active. But looking at your model portfolio, the fact that you're bullish on real estate, HFCs, corporate banks. Can I say that you prefer cyclical stocks in the short to medium term rather than growth stocks in India? No, I've got, no, I prefer growth stocks in India. My, but India is already, but I owe you want a combination of the two. But in the Western world, um, no, I, I would have a barbell strategy, but my Indian portfolio being a long-term portfolio is predominantly still in growth stocks. But you do prefer corporate banks. That's again what uh, I'm going by the model portfolio. You've liked financials in the past, but the bias, let's say if it is towards corporate banks, uh, it clearly means that you prefer uh, the, 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 you prefer that in the short term rather than betting on the retail balance sheet, one should bet on the corporate balance sheet. Well, no, the big pleasant surprise last year was that the leading Indian financials avoided significant asset quality deterioration, which could have been the consequence of the lockdown. So it seemed, I'm sure the asset quality deterioration in the overall banking system at large was much greater than for the top banking franchises. So that's given me and the market more confidence that their asset quality can be maintained during the most recent pandemic, most recent COVID wave. And that's why it was very interesting how little the leading Indian financial stocks corrected in this most recent wave compared to what happened with the lockdown, you know, in 2020. Mm -hmm. So I'm just maintaining positions in these obvious names. Mm -hmm. There is and a longer term, there's an issue of how they manage the, the competitive risk from fintech. You like Maruti? Do like TVS? Are you not worried about the EV disruption? Because if one looks at Maruti, 
they've not made a significant mark in the EV space. And, uh, you know, the similarly for TVS, there could be a bit of a challenge because there are a lot of companies who are now coming out with uh, EV sc scooter EVs. Not in India, I'm not worried about that. Maybe in Western world, yeah, but I'm not worried about that in India. I think that's premature. Chris, you've got two insurance stocks in your portfolio. Now, this is one space where serious changes have happened because of pandemic, both in terms of need, but also in terms of reinsurance. Most of the insurance companies we've spoken to, they are now telling us that the risk and the underwriting risk has increased after insurance. They may want to sell policies, but they are unable to sell policies. Why do you still like insurance in your portfolio? No, I just think that's a long-term hold. To me, that is a, a, an area you hold, and you, I, I'm not trading that around cyclical moves. And under one sector, which is the insurance sector in India, has, uh, sorry, is PSU sector, has made a comeback. Uh, they were completely bombed out. They have underperformed for the last 10 years, but now the narrative has changed. A, in India, the commodities, uh, PSU stocks are resource dominated, and then there is this entire tailwind of disinvestment. What is your view on PSUs? No, no, I have one or two in my new Indian portfolio. I wanted to, I want to have some exposure to India. If I'm an Indian managing an Indian fund, I think one obvious risk in a world where this COVID scare over the Delta variant disappears, in a world that's fully reopening, or the oil price will go much higher than from current levels. So that's a risk to the Indian macro, and that's why I think it makes sense to own some energy exposure in an Indian equity portfolio. In my view, uh, the oil market today is extremely tight, both for supply and demand reasons. And in a world that fully reopens, oil, in my view, is going over $100. You repeatedly mentioned, and you've been making, uh, you've been marking this point out for your uh, uh, clients and for those who read your newsletter, that you expect crude to stay firm and you will not be surprised if it goes to $100. But is it time to change that view? Because there are two factors happening. One, the narrative against fossil fuel and B, OPEC is also now normalizing production. No, all OPEC's done is what was expected. The, the key point about uh, oil is there's very little capex outside OPEC. So the, it's not just a demand story, it's a supply story. So the attack on fossil fuels globally, in terms of the green environmental movement, is leading, has led to a dramatic decline in capex in the fossil fuel industry. And that is basically causing a major decline in supply outside OPEC. So we have the ironic situation where the world is preparing for the end of the fossil fuel era, but yet 84% of world energy demand is still accounted for by fossil fuels. So Chris, the first half of this year was clearly dominated by the bulls. How do you see the second half of this year moving for equities, given that there is a lot of confusion what the bond markets currently are seconding? No, to me, the key issue is whether this bond market move in the U.S. is a fake out or the bond market is signaling a dramatic, uh, you know, a dramatic uh, close that the, the reopening story is over because of developments on the COVID. As of today, I don't see the data on the Delta, var the Delta variant in the Western world justifying <coughs> this dramatic bond market move. The bond market saying we're going to close up the economies again. Okay. So really, all that matters, all that matters in the short term, is this relationship between cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Chris, when we speak to companies like Tata Steel, or for that matter, other ferrous and non-ferrous metal companies. The sense which we're getting is that there is a demand supply mismatch in the commodity market, especially the industrial commodities. Uh, demand is not what created, uh, capacity is not got created in last 10 years. Demand has come back and has surprised everybody. Do you think we are in for a mega bull run in commodities? Because if commodity prices remain firm, commodity stocks will do well. And the reason why I'm asking you this is because you do have uh, metal stocks in your portfolio. 
No, I, I agree with that because I, 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 so that's why I've got a, I still have a cyclical bias because I believe the governments in the Western world are committed to major, seem to be committed to major investment spending programs. A lot of, they're committed to spending a lot of money to deal with two perceived um, social issues. One is inequality, two is um, the whole climate change story. So you could get huge investment programs driven on this green agenda, which is obviously a positive for a commodity like copper. And it seems that governments are much more willing to run big fiscal deficits. And if they can't raise the taxes to pay for these, um, to cover these uh, government spending, I can envisage more and more spend, more and more pressure on the central banks in the Western world to finance the spending. Mm. So I believe the, the political, so, to me, the whole there's far more policy activism, and if that is true, that's likely to lead to greater inflationary pressures. Yes, so I personally do not want to own government bonds in the G7 world. Chris, this entire hope and hype around the ESG theme, suddenly everybody is conscious about the environment. Uh, nobody wants to invest in a oil company or uh, no company companies company right now want they want to commit to the old sectors like oil and gas. Do you think there is a lot of hype around that? No, it's definitely overextended, but the problem is it's very, it's very, uh, very important because it's more and more of the fund flows in the Western world have ESG mandates. But do you see that changing, especially for stock market investors? A lot of sovereign funds do have the mandate that they need to stick to the ESG uh, you know, platform or ESG uh, as a framework. Uh, do you see demand coming back in, let's say, an NTPC or an ITC, or for that matter, ONGC or Coal India? Well, no, that's been a big theme for several years in Europe. That theme has now come to America in the last couple of years, and is only just entering Asia, actually. OK. Uh, and when so this is, and this is, yeah, so the oil, the oil, oil stocks are a good example. The oil stocks have gone up in the last year, but they've massively lagged the increase in the oil price. And I think ESG is the main reason for that. So Many corporates cannot own energy stocks. Chris, the pandemic has only ensured that the rich, they get richer. The pandemic has only ensured that mega caps, they become ultra caps. Do you think this will have social implications? Because one side, the list of have and have nots has only expanded and the bottom of the pyramid or the, the middle class in this pandemic has got crushed. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true in the Western world, actually. The American households are huge beneficiaries of the financial, of the pandemic financially because of big increase in transfer payments. Um, so people are being paid good money to do nothing. This is very, where it's very different in India, which is not the case. So I, I, I would make a contrast between the developed and the developing world. In the developed world, unlike after the global financial crisis, where QE drove asset prices and boosted inequality, since the COVID outbreak in the Western world, money's been put in people's pockets. So American households are net financial beneficiaries of the pandemic. That's precisely why if the American economy fully reopens, cyclical demand can surprise on the upside. Right. Six months into the Biden administration, would you call them conservative or would you call them very forthright when it comes to the economic policies? No, I think the key issue, yeah, the key issue right now, the Biden administration is clearly propagating a, a much more, a very interventionist agenda. Um, it's quite heavily influenced by the progressive wing of the Democrat Party. And it's going to be, uh, it will see, they, they're going to want to push their infrastructure stimulus Green New Deal. And the question is, will they do that in a bipartisan way? Or will they stop trying to cooperate with the Republicans and do a bigger package and try and push it through Congress through the rec reconciliation process? But the fact that, Chris, the U.S. tax rates are going to go higher, and especially on, on uh, long-term capital gains, 
can markets dismiss that? Because ultimately, if tax they go higher, it will have impact on cash flows and future earnings. Yeah, but we're not sure of the magnitudes yet. I mean, it's a negative, but I don't think yeah, the key issue for the US market, in, in my view, is monetary policy and whether it remains, right now, it remains extremely easy. And actually, this bond market rally has caused inflation expectations to come down and therefore has delayed the risk of a tapering scare. Krishna, you've been traveling and observing even in this pandemic era. As we speak, I know you are in Europe. Uh, last time when we connected, you are in Dubai. What has been your key observation in terms of a permanent change, in terms of habits, uh, behavior, also uh, adaptation, adaptation by companies? A lot of things have changed. Uh, so I, I think basically it's, it's definitely justifying more government intervention in the Western world, the pandemic. But in personal, in personal habits, the jury's out on how much work habits are going to change. Different companies are coming up with different policies. But clearly, uh, not everybody's demanding their employees go back to work five days a week in the Western world. So yeah, there is, there is a degree of change. But I think, it's too, I think it's too early to come to hard and fast conclusions. But my big picture point is that the policy responses which have been implemented in the G7 world in the response to the pandemic in terms of the aggressive fiscal and monetary easing create the likelihood that we move out of this disinflationary era we've been in since the 1980s and we move to a more inflationary era. That to me, but I am assuming ongoing government aggressive fiscal monetary easing. If we don't, if, we, if the monetary policy becomes orthodox again, we can slip back into the same deflationary trend we were in before. If the deflationary era is behind us, is one better of buying hard assets, let's say real estate, uh, metals, uh, for uh, investments in this decade? Oh, no, you're definitely better owning hard assets, yes. But, you, but I'm, I'm sorry, I've been talking in the context of people owning financial assets. So in the context of financial assets, you undoubtedly want to own equities over fixed income. But in, but in the broader context, yeah, base residential property, basic property is a probably better hedge than equities or equally as good. And, yeah. um, but, but you want to own... But in the case of the, what makes the Indian property story so interesting is that Indian property has been in an extended downturn and in, in, income growth in India has been running well ahead of property prices. In most countries in the world in recent years, property prices have been running ahead of income growth. Chris, I think in 2016 when we spoke, you said, look, you expect the retail investors to come back in India because alternates were not doing well. Now it's more like a global trend, the importance of Rabunu trader globally or importance of day traders in India. Is that trend here to stay or these are just uh, you know, seasonal birds who may just go away when the market reverses? But that's actually more of a global phenomenon, the retail thing, because what's one thing that definitely has been triggered by the, by the pandemic and the lockdowns is much bigger retail activity. So the question is whether that's a just a, just driven by the unique circumstances of the pandemic, or whether that is the way the millennial generation is going to choose to invest. Are you going to invest directly? They're not go through their through their phones. They're not going to buy conventional mutual funds. We see this retail driving market all over the world. We see it obviously in America. We see it in Korea, we see it in time, we see it everywhere, not just in India. Chris, such a pleasure having you today on ED Now. Thanks as always for taking the time out and speaking with us on a whole host of subjects.